For the last several weeks, we've been in a series entitled Lost. And what we've been doing in this series is we've been looking at several biblical truths that not only in our culture, but also in the world today, or in the church today, I believe have, in many cases, become lost, or, or maybe even forgotten. In that, in that series, we've talked about integrity, we've talked about loyalty, honor, submission, purity, and you know, it may be this morning, and, and over the last couple of weeks, as we've been discussing some of these things, maybe you've said to yourself, you know, why? Why should I live that way? Because you know, you, you look around at, at the rest of the world, and, and you know, that, that seems to, to be the pattern that the world lives by. You know, and so many times we think to ourselves, you know, why would I want to be any different than that? You know, and so we began to, to question, why should I live for Jesus? I'll never forget when I was in high school, and, and I was a good kid. I was a, a Christian at the age of, of 16, and, and I remember when I first started out, man, I was just absolutely on fire for God. But, but then over time, as you know, I saw my friends going in a different direction, and you know, I was you know, not invited to anything, whether it was a party or a, a get-together, whatever the case may be, and, and people, my friends just kind of avoided me. You know, it got to the point to where, as a Christian, I began to question this. And I remember at times, deep down inside, I would even think to myself, you know, I just want to be like everybody else. You know, I, I want to be popular, and, and, and I want to, to experience what it's like to, to you know, be loved and, and you know, to, to have a lot of friends and to go to the parties and come back on Monday and talk about how great it was. And, and there were just these times where I would, I would question, you know, why in the world am I living for Jesus? Because as we look around at the world... The world is living much different. We're going to talk about the why this morning. Look at the, the text that I've given you, Luke chapter 22. And let me, let me just kind of set the context this morning. Jesus is fixing to be arrested. He's in the garden. He's been warning His disciples about this. I mean, he's, he's been telling them this, this day is, is coming where they're going to take me and they're, they're going to kill me. They're, they're going to crucify me. And, and Peter, you know, there, there were times where Jesus would say this and, and he would make the remark, Oh, Lord, that's, that's never going to happen to you. And, and Jesus just kept telling him, Listen, it's, it's going to happen, Peter. And, and Peter says, well, you know what? Everybody else may forsake you, but I just want you to know, through those times, I'm, I'm your boy. I'm your guy. I will stand by you no matter what. And, and Jesus looks at Peter and He says, Peter, you don't understand. He says, you're going to deny me three times tonight before the rooster crows. And Peter's like, man, there, Jesus, there is, there is no way. I'm, I'm your boy. Everybody else may deny you. Everybody else may forsake you. But I will not, even if I have to die for you. And so here's Jesus, and, and He's in the garden, and it's, it's time. Let's start reading in verse 54. Then seizing Him, they led Him away and took Him into the house of the high priest. And Peter followed him at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down with them. And a servant girl was seated there in the firelight, and she looked closely at him and said, this man, referring to Peter, was with him, but, but Peter, he denied it. Woman, I, I don't know him. He said, a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also were, were with them. And, and Peter replies, man, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not with this guy. And about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. 
And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the cock crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Now if you're like me, as I've read this story time and time again over the years, in my mind, what I'm thinking to myself is, Peter, how could you? I mean, you've been with Jesus. You've saw the, the miracles. You've heard His teaching. You have sat at His feet. You even told Jesus you would never deny Him. You would never forsake Him. How could you do that? You know, before we become too judgmental or critical of, of Peter, I want to remind you that things back then were a lot different than they are today, especially in the United States. And that doesn't make what Peter did right. Okay, I don't want you to misunderstand me that I'm you know, trying to rationalize for what Peter did, but I think it's very important that we see things through Peter's eyes. You see, in, in our culture today, we protect criminals, right? I mean, we see a policeman who is who is getting a little bit rough with, with someone who's causing a disturbance, ask, ask Eddie. I'm sure he's had classes on this. You know, if, we, if a policeman is seen getting a little too rough with a prisoner or a criminal or someone who's breaking the law, it's like, whoa, 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 you can't do that. Hang on now, we're, we've got video footage of this. Don't get too rough with them. That's not the way it was during Peter's day and time. And, and, and as far as criminals are concerned in the United States today, you know, we, we like to give them their privacy and, and, and their rights, and, and we're very careful about that. In fact, if, if someone has been sentenced to, to the death sentence today, normally what they'll do is they will put them in a private room where, where no one is at, and then they will inject them. They'll give them this lethal injection and, and you know, they, they don't really feel any pain. They just, they just die. But let me tell you something. That is not the way it was back in Peter's day. You see, back then, they wanted to publicly torture you if you were a criminal. So that everyone would see. They wanted to inflict on you the most pain they could inflict for a long period of time for everyone to see. That's why the Romans loved the crucifixion. Because they would take you and they would put you up on a hill where everybody could see. And as they would walk by, there would be this tortured, mutilated body, and, and people would walk by, and, and you know what they're thinking. Man, I don't ever want to do what he did. And they would have that, you know, on a sign uh, above their head as they're dying on the cross, the crime that they would commit. And, and that's what the Roman government wanted. They wanted people to walk by and say, man, whatever he did, I don't ever want to do that. I don't ever want to be in that situation. And they would just publicly torture these individuals. And so, Peter has that in mind as he's watching Jesus being taken out of the garden. And Peter follows him. He wants to see exactly what's going to happen to, to Jesus. And, and, and he gets to, to this courtyard where, where they're holding Jesus. And, and as he's waiting, watching to see what's going to happen next, someone comes up and says, Hey, aren't you with this guy Jesus? Peter says, Oh, oh no, I, I, don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. 
And about an hour later, someone else says, yeah, you know what? I've seen you before. You're, you're one of his disciples. You're one of his followers. And, and Peter's like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And then sometime later, a lady comes up and she says, no, wait a second. You're a Galilean. You have got to be with this guy. And Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about. And all of a sudden, the rooster crows. And Jesus turns and he's, or Peter turns and he's looking eye to eye with Jesus. Can you imagine that? Denying Christ and then looking into Christ's eyes. It was that moment that the scripture says that Peter began to realize what he had done, that everything that Jesus said had come true. And so he runs and he just, I mean, just just weeps bitterly. But you see, it was this association with Jesus. Peter didn't want to be associated with Jesus. He knew what Jesus was going to, to go through. And, and so I want you to, to bear, in, bear that in mind as, as you, know, you may think to yourself, how could Peter do that? Man, I, I just don't get it. That was Jesus' boy. How could he deny him? Well, things were a lot different. Let me share with you a couple of things I, I want us to, to think about as we look at this portion of Scripture. First of all, I want us to think about how many times we denied Jesus. And for lesser things, right? No, I have. You know, my, my life wasn't in danger, but maybe it was my reputation. Maybe I didn't want to look like a Jesus freak. And so, you know, I, I just kind of played it low and, and, and I didn't tell anybody I was a Christian and I didn't talk to anyone uh, about Jesus. I mean, what, what are they going to think? You know, I don't want to be a, I don't want to come across as, as, a, as a weirdo. Or maybe someone just flat out asks us, you know, are, are you a Christian? And, and you're like, well, you know, we go to church on Sundays. You know, but you kind of play it off. You know, it's, it's my parents' thing. Just trying to keep them happy. Or, or maybe it's, well, you know, it's good for the kids. You know. And we just kind of, we kind of play it off and instead of saying, no, I, I am a Christian. And I'm going to live for Christ. Do you know Christ? Do you know what He's done for you? So many times, if, if you're like me, you've, you've denied it. Just like Peter. But you know, there, there's something that I really love about Peter. Is even though Jesus denies Christ, he comes to realize what he's done and he changes. Today, we would call that repentance. We, we don't talk a whole lot about repentance today, but, but that's very important. You know, once we come to Christ, we can't keep living like we used to. We've got to turn around and, and we've got to change. And, and that's what we see in, in Peter. He realizes what he's done, that he has denied Christ and man he changes, right? I mean, by the time you get into Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, Peter is going everywhere. He is teaching and he is preaching about Jesus. And the religious leaders, they arrest him and they bring him in. And they said, don't you ever do that again. Don't teach in the name of Jesus. And they set him free. But they continue to teach and preach about Jesus. So they arrest him again. They bring in all the apostles. And then they have them scourged. They have them beaten. for the name of Christ. And Peter and the rest of the apostles, they left, the Bible says, rejoicing that they had been counted worthy of suffering for Christ. 
And even now, to, to this day, some, some 2,000 years later, we, you know, we, we talk about Peter and, and how Peter just absolutely changed the world. By his living and his teaching and, and preaching of, of Jesus. Even under the same type of persecution. But he changed. And so this morning, I don't necessarily want you to focus on, man, you know, all the times I've, I've denied Jesus and, and, and be weighted down with that. What, what I want you to really focus in on this morning is that, you know what, you can change. Today, like Peter, you can repent of that and say, you know what, I'm no longer going to live that way. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to be a person of integrity. I'm going to be a person of, of purity. I'm going to live for Jesus, and, and I don't care who knows it. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to shout it to, to, the, to the top of the hills, you know. I am a Christ follower. I am going to live for Him. Today you can change. We keep reading, and things don't get any better. We see the guards that are holding Jesus in verses 63 through 64 before this mock trial even takes place, before the, the chief leaders. It says, The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating Him. This is hard, this next, this next phrase. They blindfolded him and they demanded, Prophesy! Who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. Can, can you imagine that? I mean, here are, these, here are these soldiers and they're coming up to Jesus. The, the same soldiers that Jesus is getting ready to die for. And, and they are punching Him in the face. And they're saying, who was that, Jesus? Come on, if you're the Son of God, then prophesy. Tell us who it was that hit you. And then another one would come up and slap Him and say, who, come on, Jesus, who hit you? If you're the Son of God, prove it right now. Tell us who it was. And they're just beating Him and they're slapping Him and they're mocking Him. And the amazing thing is, is Jesus created them. Isn't that crazy? 1 John chapter, or John chapter 1 verse 2 says, Through Him, that's Jesus, all things were made Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In, in other words, Jesus makes these people, He comes to this earth to die for them. And He allows them to put Him to death. It's just absolutely amazing. It's the greatest love story ever told. Why should... We live for Jesus because He died for us. Because He loves us. I mean, that's, that's it in, in, a, in a nutshell. I mean, Jesus, He, 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 he loves us. He, he did all of that because He loves us. Let's keep reading. Now the trial begins, verses 66 through 71. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together. And Jesus was led before them, and they said, If you are the Messiah, they said, Tell us. And Jesus answered and said, I... If I tell you, you will not believe me. And, and if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? And he replied, you say that I am. Then he said, then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. And so here's Jesus, and he's standing before this, this council, and they said, do you understand what we have against you, Jesus? 
It's the fact that you are, you are blaspheming God. You claim to be the Messiah. You claim to be the Son of God. They said, tell us right now, are you the Son of God? And I love Jesus' questioning. He said, you know what? He says, if I were to tell you, you wouldn't believe me. You wouldn't believe me anyway. And if I were to ask you, if, if you believe that I'm the Son of God, you wouldn't even give me an answer. You see, the chief priests were, were trying to do what, what many times uh, a lot of people, even Christians, try and do in, in the world today. They want to play the, the middle ground. You know, they, they want to play the politics. They don't want to offend anyway. I'm not saying that I believe in Jesus, but I'm not saying that I don't believe in Jesus either. And they just try and play it safe. You know, I'll, I'll admit, he was a good teacher, and, and, and he was a, a good person, but they're not willing to confess. Now, I believe he's the Son of God. And I believe that with all my heart as, as you continue studying about Jesus and His ministry. There were even religious leaders who believed in Jesus, but they wouldn't dare say it. They tried to play that safe middle ground so, so that no one would get upset, so that no one would, would get angry with them. But here's the thing, there comes a point to where we just, as Christians especially, we can't say that Jesus was just a good man. There comes a point to where we can't just say that Jesus was a good teacher. I mean, there, there comes a point where we have to decide either Jesus was the Son of God or He was a liar. Because that's who He claimed to be. And so in our mind, we have to decide which is it. Do we believe that He is who He claimed to be or not? They finally decided it's time to have Jesus killed. But the Jew Jewish leaders knew that they couldn't do it. They were under Roman authority. Had to be crucified by the Romans, and so they took him before Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor in charge of the entire area. And it says in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 23 this time, then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar, and he claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee, and, and he's come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Notice what Pilate does. He tries to wash his hands of Jesus. You know, here he is, he's, he's had Jesus brought to him, and, and he begins to examine Jesus, and after he gets finished examining him, he comes to realize he's innocent. Man, he hasn't done anything worthy of death. And so he tells the, the religious leaders this, and they start pressing him. They start putting pressure on him. You know, this Galilean, he's, he's bringing his teaching all the way over here. He's, he's just starting riots everywhere he goes. And Pilate goes, whoa, 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 what did you say? Did you say he's a Galilean? Oh, he's not in my jurisdiction. You, you send him to, to Herod. 
You see, Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent, but here's the thing. He didn't have the courage to stand up for Jesus. I've been there myself. There have been times in my life where I, sh- I should have stood up for, for Jesus. But, but like Herod, I, I tried to, to wash my, my hands of, of the whole matter. I tried to play it safe, you know, to where you know, people would still love me. I wouldn't offend anyone. I wouldn't make anyone upset with me. But at the same time, I wouldn't stand up for him either. He just kind of washed his hands. He sends him to Herod. And Herod, verse 8, we're going to read that in, in just a few minutes. I mean, according to tradition, he was just a, a despicable guy. But Herod is actually excited about hearing Jesus. And we get over there to uh, verse 8, and this is what it says. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see Him. From what he had heard about Him, he hoped to see Him perform some sort of of miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. And so notice, here's Jesus, and, and, and Pilate, like I said, washes his hands. He doesn't have the courage to stand up to, to the chief priest. And, and by the way, can you imagine, had he stood up for Jesus in the story we'd be able to tell today? I mean, here's Pilate, and, and he tells the religious leaders, you know what, listen, hey, you can't touch him. He is an innocent man. And they just keep on pressing him, and a riot starts out. He's like, no, I'm, I'm protecting him. And then Caesar hears about it, that Pilate's let this riot you know, take place. And so, because he you know, doesn't execute Jesus, he has Pilate killed. But wouldn't that be an amazing story to be able to stand up here today and say, man, Pilate was a man of courage. He literally gave up everything for Jesus. The power, the prestige, the the money, even his own life. Wouldn't wouldn't that have been an amazing story? But he washed his hands. And all of us, there's going to come a point in time where we have to make a choice to whether we're going to wash our hands of Jesus or we're going to all out live for him. But Pilate sends him to Herod, and and Herod, he's excited to see him because he's heard about all the great miracles. And so he tells him, you know, man, this is great. Bring him in. He says, come on, Jesus, show me a sign. Do do a miracle for me. And Jesus doesn't. And so finally, Herod and his men, they begin to ridicule, more mocking, more ridiculing. And and, and they take a a purple robe, and and they they put it on, on Jesus because that's what... That's what rich people wore, kings wore. And so you can just imagine them mocking him. Oh, he thinks he's a king. Mocking, beating. We're, we're going to talk more about this next week. But why should we live for Jesus? Because He lived for us. And then He died for us. I, I want to re- read to you a song that I heard several years ago. I, I copied the words off of the internet this morning. It's, it's a song that's always just been so beautiful to me and, and has really touched my heart over the years. But I think it, it goes along good with this lesson this morning. 
just going to read you the words. Thorns on his head, spear in his side. Yet it was a heartache that made him cry. He gave his life so that you would understand. Is there any way you could say no to this man? If Christ himself were standing here, face full of glory and eyes full of tears, and held out his arms in his nail-printed hands, is there any way you could say no to this man? How could you look in his tear-stained eyes, knowing it's you he's thinking of? Could you tell him you're not ready to give him your life? Could you say you don't think you need his love? Jesus is here with His arms open wide. You can see Him with your heart if you'll stop looking with your eyes. He's left it up to you. He's done all He can. Is there any way you can say no to this man? This morning we're going to go ahead and and offer the invitation for those of you who are here today and, and maybe you've never given your life to Jesus just want you to know Jesus loves you. He died for you. And it may be that there are some of you today who are saying, but, but Slate, you, you don't understand. His blood can't cover my sins. You, you don't understand the sins that, that I've committed. We talked about this very thing in Bible class this morning. Let me tell you, there is nothing, nothing that you could ever do to separate you from the love of God. There's nothing that you could ever do that would not be forgiven through His precious blood. And today, if you need to come forward confessing that Jesus is the Son of God, and some of you have been on that fence, and it's time to get off and have the courage today to say, you know what, I'm tired of teetering. None of this political correct stuff. I'm standing that Jesus is the Son of God. I want to live for Him. I'm repenting. I'm turning away from from the the garbage that I've, I've been committing in my life. And I want to put on Christ in baptism today. Let me tell you, you can do that. Robed in the precious blood of Jesus. Forgiven of all your sins. Or if you are a Christian today, Jesus loves you too. And it may be that you've doubted that love at at some point. Or or maybe you've turned away from that love at some point and decided, you know what, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going back into the world. Come back to Jesus. Today He's here with open arms waiting for you. If you need to respond, won't you come? Together we stand and sing.